Hello to all the four player chess fans <clears throat> who followed the channel out there. Um, starting a little bit of a new series here, uh, so let me know how you like it. Uh, the topic for today is going to be king safety. And um, I'm choosing these topics from what I think uh, players need a little bit of work on, a little bit of improvement, and <clears throat> perhaps also in certain categories that I feel qualified enough to talk on it or at least um, uh, I think I understand it a little bit more than the average player so hopefully this will help all of you out to some degree um, so to start discussing uh, King Safety in four player chess uh, I have uh, used this um, at least relatively new feature uh, where I can edit the board, edit the position and so um, I will end this video with a, an analysis of a real game, but um, here we are in the basically sandbox mode for four-player chess. Okay, so um, basically castling in four-player chess works the same way as in normal chess, and if I may, um, you may have seen certain shapes like this. Um, and sort of one of the popular ones looks like this. Um, sort of a position you can memorize as a pretty safe position for the king um, with the knight added here on the light square. I think that was an innovation by another YouTuber, Dubious Skills. Um, anyway, this is just one possibility for how to get your king safe in the game. And uh, today I'll talk more generally, at least to start, about. Um, what kind of goals you should have for doing so. And then we can get back to looking at specific positions. Um, so uh, first thing that we should address in talking about king safety is um, the idea of castling. Now I'm not just talking about castling in, in terms of the actual move, but um, there are also other ways to castle, like castling by hand. Um, and even after you've castled, you can sort of continue to make a slightly more castled formation, that is, a castle around your king, um, after you complete the formal castling move. So I'm talking about castling in a more general sense now. Um, okay, so what is the point of castling? The point of castling is to get your king away from the action. Okay, so if your king is in the center of the board, um, just taking another look here at our at our sandbox mode, um, it can certainly later come under fire from this light squared bishop. Um, there's another light squared bishop that could come participate. Uh, whereas if it were in the corner, okay, if you've already done something like castling, well now yes, this light squared bishop could still get nearby, but uh, this other green light squared bishop has no way to attack the king. Okay, from its normal diagonal, it would have to come around like this. So for that reason, um, you know, um, having your king in a corner would mean that there are fewer pieces that can naturally or or readily attack it than before. Um, also, you can see in the game there are uh, sort of these these chunked out corners, which also means that if my king were on a light square like right here and the bishop were here. Uh, this would not like be check here, okay, because of the corner being cut off. So having your king also against the side provides a little bit of extra um, cover. So that's generally why we would rather keep our king on the side than in the middle. Um, all, you know, everything else held equal. Uh, there are certainly situations where you would keep it in the middle, but um, you would not be as happy about it as if it were safe in the corner. Okay, um, another reason we castle is to improve the piece coordination. So as you can see, after I've castled and after I've moved my bishops and knights out, um, rooks, are, rooks and queens are free to move along the back rank, and um, one of the main reasons to castle in this game is to uh, start moving your central pawns forward and try to promote them using your rooks as um, guardians of those pawns while they're being pushed. So. Uh, another important part of castling is to improve the piece coordination um, that you can have in the game. Um, now to expand on my point about 
continuing to castle after you've already moved the castling after you've already made the castling move I will say um, this connects back to something else I know um, which is that in shogi or Japanese chess um, interesting game if you have the chance um, I suggest checking it out uh, in shogi um, typically speaking um, as far as I know and I don't know that much about the game, but as far as I know, uh, players do spend the first five to ten moves doing nothing but getting their king castled. Okay, so that could, uh, and their kings don't have an explicit castling move, so that's why it takes longer than in, in our chess, but um, say, you know, your king and rooks uh, and queen fig configuration looks like a normal configuration at the start. Okay, so in shogi you might you might see something like this. You know, you might see um, you know, let's move this bishop here. Let's move this knight out. Um, I don't know. I'm just making moves. Let's get the king to the very corner. Let's get the queen here. Um, let's get this knight back here. Let's get this bishop out. Let's get this rook as close as possible. And now let's start playing the game. Okay. And this is done for, you know, specific reasons, uh, namely that, um, namely that in Shogi it works a lot like Crazy House. I think Crazy House is actually based on Shogi, where if you capture a piece, um, then you get that piece in your hand and you can put it down anywhere. So, if that's the case, your king needs to be extra safe because attacks can come out of nowhere just based on placed pieces. So having your king in a very safe position to start with would be something worthwhile, okay? But uh, um, in this game, we do have to balance a little bit. Uh, since it's not it's not a one versus one game, you have to balance a little bit between, um, you know, peace mobility and uh, other things like that, too. Obviously, if you spend all your turns and all your moves just moving your king into the corner and surrounding it with pieces, well, then your opponents might be able to make a lot of queens, and it won't matter how safe your king is because they will just trade everything and you will lose. So, we do want to keep that in mind. Okay, let me get back to a starting position. So what would be a good idea for this game? How, how, how castled should our king be? Well, I would say more than in regular chess, you know, one versus one chess, but less than in shogi, probably. Um, so let's just look now at a couple techniques that um, I have seen come up for castling. Okay, so you can typically castle kingside or queenside. Um, on the side that you're going to castle, I would say it's usually pretty important that you block that side off with the other player to your right or to your left. So if I'm going to block off the right, you know, I'll move this rook pawn up too. How does that help me block off the right? Well, um, if I have a sort of bishop, fi, and keto going here, um, yes, my, my opponent can now not move this pawn up too. Okay, he can only move it up one. And if he ever moves this up one, then we can see that... Uh, this diagonal will no longer be active for him. Okay, he can no longer. I mean, he can move this up and trade like this. But even then, this bishop, uh, the dark squared bishops, will never interact unless unless red makes that happen by uh, actually capturing this pawn. So, and what you often might see the green player do instead is actually move this pawn up too, and then it's like really blocked off. So if that's the case, um, something like this would make your king very safe, and also, um, you know, how could this king how can this king really be assailed now? You would need um, to sacrifice a lot of pieces in order to do so. Um, you know, potentially a knight check could come from this dark square. Okay, but if it's going to come, then you could just move the king back here, and it would be fine. Uh, okay, so this is a typical setup for the king side. Um, another one that you might see if your opponent gets to make this move first, well now 
you can't do that same setup. And if you're planning to castle on this side, then you might need to go here. Um, potentially, you might even want to leave your rook inside and not castle, but castle by hand. This is because it's a little bit weaker now that you're still open to this dark squared bishop, so you might need extra protection for this pawn. If this rook's over here, then it might be beneficial later for green to sack here. Especially if there, he can get a heavy piece on this, um, yes, on this file. Um, so, since it's a little bit more dangerous, sometimes people leave uh, a rook inside the castle, or um, you might see something like moving this knight back and moving it out here. Um, I've seen stuff like that before. Uh, what else have I seen? I've seen people move this rook up, move the king over. Uh, bishop, this bishop will like come to here or so, and you can also bring another knight over. Something defensive like this. Um, unfortunately, you're always going to have your knights getting kicked this way. So, for me, oh, uh, reset everything. Uh, let's get reset. For me, I prefer if I'm going to castle king side to have. A setup where I get uh, I get my bishop fianchettoed and the opponent is sort of forced to close this. Um, another thing you might want to consider is not castling until your opponent closes this, because if they castle the other way, um, you know, if they castle towards you, that's great, because then you can castle here and you can both have safe kings, you know, friendly, friendly sort of situation. But if they castle the other way, they might consider actually going here and opening you up. And then, well, it's still not that dangerous. You'd still have a decently safe king, but now it's not looking as nice. So, um, nice to delay castling until you really need to, if you can. Okay. What about the queen side then? Well, queen side castling, um, almost always, again, you would like to block off with the rook pawn and have your opponent uh, do one of these. Again, nothing is forcing them to do this, but uh, any time, if they don't do this, say they go here instead, which is a common move, any time you open up the diagonal, you're putting, you know, you're putting the onus on them. Um, and it does depend on which position you're spawned in, so now, if I'm red, I'm a little bit scared because blue could take my bishop, and then there are two other turns that could happen before I can take back. So blue might have an advantage here over me. Whereas if I rotate the board, how do I rotate again? R? Because R is rotate. Uh, okay, well, it, I can't rotate it right now, but if you can, if you can tell just by looking, uh, the person to my left here, you know, if I castle to my left, that's castling queenside. If blue castles to his left, he's castling kingside. So the rotational, um, well, it's not exactly rotationally symmetric going all the way around, right? That's my point I'm trying to make. So red and yellow would rather castle, um, well, if they castle to the right, it's king side. Um, yeah. And for green and blue, if they castle to the right, it's queen side. So that one one thing to note. Um, I don't think I don't think I want to spend too much time discussing that. It's a little bit uh, perhaps a little bit too advanced for this video. But anyway, um, if I'm going to castle queenside, I might do something like this. Hope that um, blue will block it off, or um, try to force him to block it off. But anyway, if you see this kind of thing happen, then you can say to yourself, "All right, now it's going to be safe to castle." and I will castle and I will get my king over here or here or here. All of these are very very safe. Um, but only if blue has blocked this off already. So um, one thing you might want to try to do in your games which really can help with king safety is to try and block off um, one attack path. So and typically opponents will be encouraged to do so because if you block it off with someone well it's really hard for you to attack them but it's also really hard for them to attack you 
and if you can also use that to keep your king very safe well then you can completely focus on the other side of the board and attacking that person while um, you know any attack that comes here will never endanger your king so that is uh, another good thing um, what else with king safety well another thing to think about when castling is well what pieces should I leave around my king um, since I'm trying to create such a safe king and what pieces should I use for offense what pieces should I use for defense and this gets into the more general topic of piece value in four player chess um, which is that knights fall drastically in value compared to compared to normal chess because of their severely limited range okay they still just move up to and over one or over to and f1 while bishops uh, have many more choices than they did in the original chess game so you know if I can block off seven go ahead and do arrows I can also annotate a little bit like this. That just got me out of it completely. I have to learn how to reset arrows. I could probably just click clear. Yeah. Okay, so if I just show this right now, this is how big your chessboard would typically look. Oh, I still made it seven. Okay. That does not delete arrows. Okay, well if you can imagine it, you know, one one bigger here. Basically this is as far as a bishop could move. It wouldn't be able to move outside of these black boundaries. Um, however, now look how far these bishops can move. Significantly more movement. You know, three extra choices for that dark squared bishop just from the start and the same for the light squared bishop. While knights, um, they have more possible places they could go, but that doesn't really matter when you're considering move by move. Um, what are How many choices are available to a piece? It still maxes out for a knight at eight. And uh, since the board is so wide, it takes knights forever to get across. Bishops can zoom across in a move or two. Yeah, I mean a bishop I mean, with the exception of some of these uh, crazy locations, a bishop can get anywhere in two moves while a knight might take you know, one, six, six or seven moves to get across the board. So, uh, knights are significantly devalued compared to, compared to regular chess. Clear. And, oh, I really don't know how to e reset those arrows efficiently. I'll just do it like that. Um, now, uh, that means that knights are not good for attacking. Okay, um, with the exception of you know, if your opponent castles towards you, then knights can perhaps get in the action. But in general, typically speaking, knights are not good for attacking. If your opponent's castle away from you, or if you're trying to attack the person across from you, knights are useless. Okay, they will take forever to get there. So their natural uh, state, their natural home, is to be a defender, because number one, they are less valuable than rooks, bishops, queens, all the other pieces that might be attacking them. So if your opponent's attacking you and he has to trade into your knights to get at your king, then you're already gaining value while he's attacking. Um, second of all, that leaves your bishops and your queens and your rooks free to do what they do best, to maximize their utility as attackers and pieces that can move a farther distance. So, uh, many of these castled formations that you will see will include knights as the defenders. So the one that I just showed, like this, okay, this knight must stay here. Alright, it's an important defender. Okay, it's, you know, it's invaluable to have, the, okay, to have this knight to recapture uh, on this square and then uh, perhaps move back later. Okay, now the knight's covering this square, this square is covered, these two squares are covered by the bishop, and you have a very nice defensive uh, setup going. 
Hey, imagine if this knight were not here. Well, now, anytime this pawn captures you, um, you suddenly have a broken pawn formation. This could get picked off, and you have an open file in front of your king. Um, so the knight is very useful as a defender there. Again, with the second knight coming here, it's even safer. Okay, and these knights are still keeping some attention towards the center of the board while also thinking about being defenders. That is pretty much as optimal as you can get when using a knight. Um, what other sorts of formations have I seen? One, uh, I would say earlier formation was um, sort of bringing this knight around to here. Um, maybe getting this bishop out to here and trying to castle this way and bring the king up like this. Uh, this is a little bit unfortunate. Um, it looks nice, you know, optically the king is well supported by the two knights, um, but unfortunately your your knight here can pretty easily get kicked. Um, and if you so desire to stop that by moving here, well now you can't you can't defend that pawn with the pawn. So you might have something like this, and then it's just a little bit weaker structure than the one I just discussed. So, uh, in any case, there are different ways to do it. You can find out the way that works best for you. Um, but uh, I encourage you to before you before you even play the game to sit down in sort of a sandbox mode like I'm doing right now, and and sort of move the pieces around, you know make a few moves, find out what your ideal castling um, setup would look like, and then go to implement that in your games. Another reason why this type of castling is so important in four-player chess as opposed to regular chess is because you have a lot of time, a lot of moves, that is. Um, players, um, especially at the high levels in four-player chess, spend many, many moves it could be, you know, 30, everyone gets 30 moves before any pieces are captured. 40 moves. Um, just because people are spending so much time to get themselves in a perfect situation, an absolutely safe situation, before they um, go on the offensive. Okay, and that's also part of king safety. Okay, so. Um, yeah, I suggest you play with it in sandbox mode find out what you like, find out what setups you think would be defensible, and then go test them out and see if they work for you. I gave you a few of my suggestions and now I will also uh, conclude this video with uh, an example of a recent game I just had. So let's go into that. This was played today, about two hours ago. Um, and 57 moves, not the longest game, but I will say it was quite interesting. So. Um, couple 1400s here under 1300. Um, I'm 1649 right now. I'm getting for the leaderboard eventually, but I don't play that often, so um, could be a while, especially if I don't keep a win streak going. Um, but you'll see in this game immediately, in the first move against red, I decide to um, block it off. Okay, just block it off. And red's reaction to that was to continue pushing. Um, I noticed that um, yellow and green were not really doing anything about this pushing of red. And for better or for worse, uh, I have decided in some games to, to take it upon myself to stop this promotion. Um, especially because I have now at least, you know, I've given up the fact that I could castle kingside because now yellow already controls this diagonal. I don't want to trade bishops with yellow, so... Um, I've given up my my perfect setup on on the left, so I, I really do want a castle right now, and that means I do not want red to have an extra queen with which to attack me after I do so. So at this night move, I'm deciding, hey, I'm going to go try and stop red. Okay, and this is a little technique you can use. Um, okay, and uh, green decided he also wanted to stop red here, but he did not do it in the right way. So he thought maybe you know. He takes there, I take the pawn, one of us can get out, but in between that red head does have another move, so I think green miscalculated there. Um, and I, I noticed that red took a turn off from pushing the pawn, so I just also took a turn off from trying to stop it. 
and I also decided, well, I'm going to develop my bishop along this diagonal since yellow is coming from the other diagonal. Okay, and red continues to push the pawn, and now I do block it. So, um, yes, uh, red, I guess, you know, red could come out with the bishop here and um, tickle my knight a little bit. He did not decide to do that. Um, instead, he decided to block it off with me, uh, which I was very happy about, because now I can get into get into a situation where I can go for my normal castling. I do also have to worry, though, about uh, Yellow's Bishop, which does come in the direction of my castling. Um, but I've already noticed that um, since Red made a move like this, I'm not playing against super strong players. Okay, but he's simply trying to fianchetto on both sides. And, uh, okay, green took up a nice outpost for his own knight there. That's one of the disadvantages for yellow of having moved his pawn out like this. Um, I did commit to this move, because I do want to de develop my bishop along the other diagonal. So now, um, yes, yellow will get a pretty ideal castling formation on his king side. I will preserve uh, protection of this knight. And things are still proceeding smoothly, with red not yet having promoted. That's good. That's really good. Um, I did allow a check here, but I noticed that, hey, green and yellow probably can't do anything to me within one move. so. It's probably okay. I mean, it could be something like yellow takes this pawn, then red checks me, and yellow takes this pawn next. Um, but, you know, if yellow takes this pawn, nothing's forcing red to check, and I had no reason to believe that they're cheating uh, right now. Okay. So, I then protected that area. And. I also saw the opportunity to move this pawn up, um, give a little bit more range to my bishop, and um, perhaps prepare for more pushing later. Now, um, red did drop a pawn here, so that's really good. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but now, okay, now yellow has come into the center, and it's much easier to stop red's pawns. Um, as yellow is now helping me to do it. Okay. Um, at this point, I do realize that my king actually might be safer going to the other side. So this is um, one of the other things I did want to talk about with king safety, which is delaying the castling. Um, I do now have my knights on nice squares here. Yellow has also castled in my direction, so I am more inclined to castle in the same direction, as any attack he does on me will also open up his own king. Uh, I also noticed red did not castle towards me, so that means what exactly? That means any attack that comes from red uh, on this side will will be more natural for him and will not endanger his own king. Um, plus he also might be annoyed at me because I've been stopping the promotion of his pawns for so long. So um, Now I definitely see red is actually maybe going to start attacking me, or initiate trades at least. So I decided to step away. Okay, now when he, at least when he takes the bishop, it will not be with check, so I will have a, a choice in the matter. Um, and I even decided that it would be better to castle by hand than castle normally. There's already a bishop attacking my pawn here, and the queen could very easily come to, to either of these files, so I decided to keep the rook there and just move the king over by itself and even the rook up. Um, so now I'm feeling very safe here. And this is all normal and good. Um, yellow not moving his pawn up to... I think that's actually okay right now because there's not much danger coming on this file. And he's leaving the possibility of just moving up one and trading later to open me up. So I do think that's a good choice on his part. Uh, now I do see the opportunity to start pushing my own pawns. 
Um, okay, here red red promoted to a queen, but also gave up his knight by doing so. But green also made himself very open against a red with two queens now. Um, okay, I retreated this bishop. Go through a little bit more quickly now, since my king's already safe. Let's see what happens. Well, green left his king wide open. One of his knights is not playing defensive duty where it should be. Instead, it's doing what? Well, it's just trading for another knight. That does nothing. Right? He's being attacked by two people, and his knight's trading for another knight. That's not how you defend. Um, he's about to get killed. Um, and I like how red's also, like, spite capturing a few of yellow piece, yellow's pieces, and one yellow's actually helping him, so... Um, Okay, and now, um, yes, I could have tried promoting last turn because I expected white to give uh, red to give green checkmate, but um, at the same time, I can make it so that I'll wait till green dies, and then these pawns can never capture my pawns, and it'll be very easy to promote. My next plan. Okay, nice, and green's also taking a lot of red with him. And I'll simply wait till green dies and then promote everything, which is what happened. So uh, a little bit scary along this diagonal, but I have um, a piece in the way. I also have two pieces protecting my king here, this knight and this rook. Not too worried. And now I am starting to promote. And oh, again here. Let me point this out. Yellow moved his rook to a place where it could give a check. And there are so many things I could do right now, but the first thing I wanted to do was get my king out of being checked. Um, because anytime yellow gives a check, that means I could lose a queen. Because what will red do? Well, red will just come capture one of my queens and move away after I move out of check. So better to just, in the situations where you can be 2v1, um, Make it make it harder for your opponents to 2v1 you. If they really are dedicated, they can do it, always, or at least most of the time, but make it harder. Make it so that they have to sacrifice more to do so. That's exactly what I'm doing. Um, I do want to, oh, I do want to talk about that point more after this, after I finish talking this, talking about this game. Okay, now, uh, yellow's sort of getting even more frisky here. I'm still not too worried about it though, got plenty of defenders here. Um, I'm also threatening to start attacking him now, and he noticed that and defended. Okay. Um, while I'm already starting to win, I'm just sort of removing all of the ways for my opponents to come, at, come back into the game and create more greens. Um, and when there's nothing to do with that, I simply start taking things. And then we see a pretty quick ending here. I did give up the false queen to finish off yellow, and then, uh, yeah, my king never came under fire. So this is just a quick cleanup now. And that's it. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to go back to, though, is a situation where red and white, uh, red and yellow could have um, 2v1 me. And sort of around here, you know, where I st start seeing yellow um, get ready to check. I moved out of the check, and where yellow moved his queen, yes, yellow moved his queen there, and there are queens coming also from red. One thing about getting 2v1 in this game is that um, it's almost impossible to stop. Okay, because they just get two moves for every one of your moves. That's extremely powerful. However, Okay, one really important part of being uh, a four-player chess player is is um, being the being not being the lowest hanging fruit, which is to say not being the person that's easiest to attack. Okay, so actually green in this game did get two v one and he died. Um, it could have been me who was two v one instead, but guess what? My king was about four to five times safer than green's king was. They would have had to invest and sacrifice you know, three or four, t three, four or five times as much material just to kill me. So um, if they had done that, well then almost certainly green would have a huge advantage. 
So instead, they they decided they could kill green cheaply. Um, and if you can kill someone cheaply, well, that could be a very viable option for you to do. Um, so so it's not exactly about making your king uh, invulnerable because that's um, that's that's an interesting word and it's not a word that you can ever use in chess. Um, you know, before before certain things have played out. Right. At the end of this game, yeah, my king was invulnerable. But um, as long as there are two other players with queens in the game, you know, your king is probably not invulnerable. And what you're supposed to do in that case is to make your king less vulnerable, okay? Or make yourself not the lowest hanging fruit, not the easiest person to attack, and uh, make it harder for your opponents to attack you. And if your king is much harder to attack than someone else's, well, that means... Uh, you have an advantage over them. Okay, they will be the one attacked if they are easier to attack. Okay, um, that maybe that's a, that's a good topic for another video. Um, something more about the psychology of the game, but it also does tie in with king safety. So uh, that's the, really the reason why we want to get this done, this castling. Um, and I think I did a pretty good job this game of showcasing that. Okay, even though I had a rook trapped in here that did nothing the whole game. Okay, it didn't even matter because um, I was able to make a lot of queens while red and yellow were finishing off someone who they could very cheaply attack. Interesting. Okay, I'm not saying uh, my play was perfect or that it would have worked perfectly at a in a higher elo game, but this is um, this is something to use as evidence or or something you can use to build your own theories and uh, yeah and logical supposition. So hope you enjoyed the video and leave me a comment if you think there's anything that I said was right or that I said was wrong and uh, I hope to continue this series in the future talking a little bit more in depth about the four player chess um, various strategies and, and my own experience uh, implementing them. Alright, uh, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one.